said and done. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are privileged to have this morning Dr. David DeBrain uh, speaking to us. Dr. Brain, Dr. DeBrain has been pastor of New Covenant Baptist Church in Johannesburg, South Africa since 2003. He holds a Doctor of Theology degree from the University of South Africa. He is a lecturer at Shepherd's Seminary in Africa uh, and the author of several books. He is a frequent con conference speaker, uh, has a weekly radio program that's heard throughout much of Central South Africa, and regularly blogs as part of the ministry website that I am involved with, Religious Affections Ministries. Uh, so we've known each other for a number of years, met at a conference years ago, have spoken together at some conferences, blogged together, contributed to some books together, and uh, very, very thankful. I was just talking to Dr. Kreider. I need to get down to South Africa sometime soon. I uh, would love to get down there, but really appreciate his ministry. Dr. DeBrain is a careful thinker, uh, very articulate in communicating biblical ideas of theology and worship and aesthetics and culture, so thankful for his contribution in a number of ways. And uh, he did his uh, doctoral dissertation on the subject of beauty, and so I thought it would be valuable for us this morning to hear from him on that subject. So thank you so much, Dr. DeBrain, for uh, being with us today. Let's welcome Dr. DeBrain. Well, thank you so much, Scott. All right, thank you. Um, is uh, hope my audio is coming through, and um, hope that uh, this will be a profitable time. Thank you, Scott. It's a, a joy to be with you and uh, to be a part of this together. Um, I think that um, Zoom technology has not yet advanced to where you get live subtitles. So if you're struggling with my accent, I'm afraid you'll just have to get the recording and, and keep replaying it. So uh, we are glad that we can spend this time together looking at the topic of beauty. And in this talk, I'm going to tackle something of a giant, and that is the meaning of beauty. Uh, I think that's a tall order. But I hope we can make sense of it together and still have some time for discussion. And we can consider the topic today along three lines. First, I'd like to briefly talk about the restoration and the resistance to beauty in our day. Then, just a few moments talking about the relevance of beauty to Christians and point to its importance in our current cultural moment. But then we'll spend the bulk of our time, thirdly, discussing the reality of beauty. And we're going to aim at a definition. And I'm going to suggest that we can group the competing definitions of beauty into four main ideas. And from those, we'll choose one with the help of Jonathan Edwards. And then we'll consider the implications of that definition. So let's begin with the restoration and resistance to beauty. As you likely know, beauty has been, for the last decade or so, or probably two decades, it's been experiencing something of a renaissance in academia in general, and in Christian academia in particular. Beauty spent a long season in the wilderness, perhaps brought about by the general abandonment of God in Western thinking, and the disparagement of the arts that came from that tradition. Beauty has also been rejected because of the effete aestheticism that came out of the 18th century. Partly also the philosophical winds that have been hostile to Christian transcendentals of absolute truth, absolute goodness and beauty. But in the past few decades, beauty has made a surprising comeback. We now are hearing the terminology of beauty in all kinds of places, including scientific literature where we hear about the beauty of a mathematical solution or the beauty and elegance of nature's ways or the beauty of the cosmos and its laws. Beauty has now become the specific study of Christian academics laboring in very diverse fields, liturgics, Trinitarianism, ethics, Christianity and the arts, theological aesthetics. And this interest in beauty extends to a broader non-Christian postmodern society, though perhaps more sensually than consciously. Elspeth Thiessen, in her book, Theological Aesthetics, points out that there's be, uh, been an aestheticization of everyday life in postmodern society. The powerful effect of images in mass media 
the ubiquity of popular music, the worship of the body and of youth, the pursuit of instant gratification, the longing for religious or quasi-religious experiences, these are all forms of sensuous experience and phenomena, which is to say they are aesthetic experiences, aesthetic phenomena. Our culture is not disinterested in beauty. But paradoxically, the increase in attention to the idea of beauty coincides with a sentiment that beauty is disappearing, if not absent, from contemporary art. The late Roger Scruton, spoke of the modern flight from beauty in art with an attendant cult of ugliness, as he called it, determined to desecrate and profane. So why is there both a push and a pull regarding beauty? Why is there both a renewal of beauty and a rejection of beauty? Well, to think about it negatively, the first reason for resistance to the notion of beauty has to do with a concern for justice. That might sound odd at first, but there are many who regard the idea of beauty as hostile to justice. In a world where beautiful images are often detached from moral value, there is a risk of just loving the idea of beauty as a kind of fetish, as a kind of self-consolation built in pure fantasy, detached from the perplexity and pain of life. And the reaction to this prettifying of genuine suffering has been the overreaction of rejecting the whole idea of beauty. A second objection to beauty, a second reason why there is a resistance to it is because of what Roger Scruton calls the kitchification of religion and art. And this refers to a preference for sentimentalism over genuine feeling for sensuous trappings rather than genuine art, for narcissistic fantasies over the mirror of reality. Roger Scruton himself, who defends the idea of beauty, suggests that reactions to the Disneyfication, as he calls it, of art and religion, have produced an opposite postmodern desecration, a deliberate pursuit of what is disturbing or grotesque or obscene. There is a third form of resistance to beauty that is unique to Christians, particularly the evangelical kind. And often evangelical Christians have claimed that pragmatic concerns such as evangelism and missions must trump any concern with beauty. Since the Enlightenment, some evangelicals have viewed art according to simple moral concerns or pragmatic values their view of beauty has been judged through sentimental lenses, saying such as God looks at the heart, not at the art, or as unrelated to objective aesthetic standards. For many evangelicals, the old Roman maxim, there is no accounting for taste, would be something they go by. So with all this push and pull, this renewal of interest and this rejection, why should Christians like you and me be concerned with beauty as an idea? Why would we even worry about defining it? Let's consider then just for a moment the reasons for beauty. The reasons. There are external reasons that have to do with beauty as an apologetic for the Christian faith. And then there are internal reasons that have to do with Christian spirituality and worship. Let's consider just a few external reasons that give testimony to the Christian faith. First, beauty deals directly with the nature of reality. Consider, is the universe essentially material, an impersonal collection of atoms that accidentally produced minds, or is the universe essentially personal, a meaningful and therefore beautiful communication from the eternal mind to ours. Beauty says loud and clear, reality is personal. In fact, beauty cannot be consistently upheld in an atheistic worldview. Atheists may agree that beauty exists, as they might agree that goodness or ethics exist, but they have no real basis in reality for such a thing. 
because a sterile universe doesn't have rules, a dead cosmos doesn't try to please and delight, or in any way evaluate itself. Beauty, if it exists, is essentially supernatural. It's a pattern of pleasure and harmony from designer to his creation, where both the message and the ability to read it are placed there by the creator. It's an external witness to the reality of the Christian faith. Another external reason is beauty explains the problem of knowing truth, knowing reality. For the last 500 years, the West has struggled with the question of how do subjects know objects outside of themselves? How do we know what we know? And how can we verify anything we know? Should we use reason, experience, tradition, faith, imagination, authority? What should we use to know anything with certainty? Can we know anything objectively? Or is all knowledge purely subjective? Beauty, understood from a Christian standpoint, actually provides a compelling answer. Because on the one hand, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty needs a beholder to evaluate it. You need a subject. But on the other hand, the lack of that perception can be the fault of the beholder. Beauty exists and some fail to perceive it. And what this shows us is that reality and truth is both independent of observers and yet at the same time rightly or wrongly perceived by observers. And this leads us to a biblical epistemology. When the heart possesses the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Or to put it another way, beautiful souls will perceive the beauty that is out there. These external reasons provide an apologetic for the Christian faith. The pursuit of beauty speaks to unbelievers as to the realities that we profess. But beauty also affects Christians internally. That is, it's not merely a decorative extra. It's fundamental to Christian living and obedience. How so? Well, beauty is integral to Christian worship. We probably agree that the neglect of beauty within Christian liturgy and practice in the last century have had visible effects on Christian worship. Concessions to the Enlightenment's view of neutral objectivity have produced a less fruitful era for Christian expression in the last hundred years. When we think of music, poetry, literature, architecture, the plastic arts, our lopsided emphasis on scientific knowledge in the last century has produced little to rival Bach, Mendelssohn, little in poetry to rival George Herbert, Isaac Watts, even Christina Rossetti, little in literature to rival Daniel Defoe, Jane Austen, little in painting to rival Rembrandt. And this is hamstringing much in Christian worship. William Edgar remarks that the seeker-friendly church growth movement is now reconsidering its adaptation to contemporary culture in its worship, finding in his words that its target market missed the mysterious, the prophetic, and the beautiful, especially the rich musical heritage of the church of the ages. Similarly, Edgar points to the large-scale exodus that we're seeing from Protestant evangelicalism to Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. And that, he says, is partly due to aesthetics, the perceived barrenness of beauty in the average evangelical or low church. Another internal reason why beauty is important to the Christian faith is that beauty is deeply connected to our sanctification. Beauty and morality are not separate domains. They're deeply intertwined. Good souls love beautiful things. Depraved ones love what is despicable. Think of the horror of people that love torture or rape or child pornography. And yet people do. They even film it, laugh at it, share it. Such people are finding pleasure in what is wicked and ugly. 
Sin's deforming power leads souls to love what is ugly and to even despise what is beautiful. For them, ugly has become beautiful. Beautiful has become ugly. They love darkness for their deeds are evil. John 3.19. In other words, true beauty humanizes the soul. And to the degree that one is growing in Christ-likeness is the degree to which he loves the beautiful. As Paul writes in Philippians 1, that as, we, as our love grows in knowledge and in all discernment, we will approve the things that are excellent. The kind of judgment that one uses for ethical judgments is very similar to the one kind used for aesthetic judgments. And therefore, there's an intertwining between the good and the beautiful. And a third internal reason for why we should pursue beauty as Christians is because beauty appears to be at the heart of motive. Human action has beauty at its core. People are moved and inclined towards what they think is best, what they think is beautiful. People always pursue what they think will bring them pleasure. People are motivated by what they think is the most comprehensive explanation of reality. Once again, the nature of the heart will then determine what it thinks is pleasurable and real and good and symmetrical. In other words, love corresponds to your idea of beauty. However grotesque, however bizarre, however irrational, the behavior of a human can be explained by some inner idea of something as beautiful. Beauty is at the heart of motive and therefore at the heart of obedience, of volition. So I hope with those words, we can see beauty is important. Externally, it provides an apologetic for the Christian faith. And internally, it's fundamental to Christian experience, to our worship, to our personal sanctification, even to individual choice. But all of this now brings us to the third and main focus of our talk today, which is the reality of beauty, the reality of beauty. If beauty is real, then what is it? How do we define it? Can we define it? Well, let's set ourselves some boundaries for defining beauty. First of all, if we're going to define beauty as Christians, a definition of beauty must be biblical. For Christians, scripture must have the first and final say regarding definitions of matters ultimate and transcendental. Special revelation grants the interpretation of general revelation, not the other way around. One does not reason from creation to an understanding of God. Rather, God's special revelation provides the interpretive framework to view the world. So beauty found in nature, in the arts, or even in perceptions of God himself in human experience must be judged to be beautiful from the aesthetic grid that scripture provides. This is not to say that scripture will necessarily need to give us an explicit philosophical definition of beauty. Rather, any definition that we obtain should be derived from and consonant with the teachings of Scripture. Our second boundary for defining beauty is that any definition we choose should appear in the Christian tradition. The saying goes, if something is wholly new, it's seldom true. And if something is true, it's seldom new. And Christians sensitive to that truth recognize that scripture itself invokes tradition in 2 Timothy 2 verse 2, the handing down of truth from one generation to another. And so we should expect to find a good part of our understanding of beauty within the writings and the art of Christians of the past. A third boundary for our definition of beauty is that it should also be sensitive to the discussions of philosophy. Beyond the discussion within the Christian intellectual tradition, the question of beauty has been a topic of discussion for philosophers dating back to classical Greece. And the presence of the common grace of God in human culture 
means that truth can be found in both believer and unbeliever. And our fourth and final boundary for our definition is that it should be practical and workable in the lives of Christians. A definition that is so abstract that few minds can grasp it, let alone implement it, is practically useless to Christians and especially useless to the daily Christianity of Christian spirituality. A useful definition of beauty can be understood and adapted into worship, discipleship, and fellowship within the local church and the lives of ordinary Christians. So with those four boundaries, let's survey the field for how beauty has been defined by Christians and non-Christians alike. What have people said beauty is? Definitions of beauty and the beautiful can be broadly classified into four types, classical, transcendental, subjective, and theological. Let's take those in turn. The first is classical definitions. All classical definitions use some form of what Edward Farley calls the great theory of beauty. By this, he means that which originated in Pythagoras and was especially developed by Plato and later Platonists. All Christians who were Neoplatonists or influenced by Plato developed very similar versions of the same idea. What is the idea? The classical or the great theory of beauty simply defines beauty as essentially proportion. At the heart of this theory is the idea that the distinctive pleasure of beauty is the harmony of parts to a whole. In this idea, beauty is symmetry. It's symmetry between composite parts or elegant relationships between parts that combine to make a unified whole form. And this symmetry is what provokes pleasure in the beholder. Both Augustine and Aquinas held versions of this definition. Some non-Christians, even contemporary non-Christians, have even given a Darwinistic version of this idea, saying that humans find beauty as they spot order within complexity, saying the intellect is ever seeking patterns of order. This is the first set of definitions, the classical definitions. A second group of definitions we can call transcendental definitions because they define beauty in relation to the other two transcendentals of the triad of truth, goodness, and beauty. And in these definitions, beauty is understood to be some form of goodness and truth. For example, Richard Villarizzo says that beauty is identical to the good. Skillen says that beauty is a form of moral goodness. Stratford Caldecott wrote that beauty is the radiance of the true and the good. Munson and Drake in their book, Arts and Music uh, for Students, writes that beauty is the capacity to proclaim truth and to realize goodness. Mortimer Adler claimed that beauty is a synthesis of truth and goodness. So this group of definitions essentially says beauty is some combination or some form or some incarnation of truth and goodness. A third group of definitions, for lack of a better term, could be grouped under the heading subjective definitions. People who define beauty this way define it almost entirely as its effects or its experience within the perceiving subject. That is, beauty is the peculiar pleasure, the ethical effect upon the subject. It's the response of the perceiver. Partly borrowing from the classical theory, this definition mostly sees the human mind as experiencing beauty when it recognizes relationships of harmony and unity. Immanuel Kant, in his idealism, he sees beauty as the mind recognizing purposiveness without having an inquisitive interest in the object. So the subjective definition doesn't always say that beauty is unreal, 
but it mostly locates beauty in the beholder, in the subject. This brings us then to a fourth group of definitions, theological definitions. Theological definitions take God himself as the foundation of beauty or as the ultimate instantiation of it. In these definitions, beauty is either an attribute of God or a way of speaking of God's being or God's relations. Now, I would suggest that as Christians, we are pushed to use some kind of theological definition for beauty. After all, if beauty is some kind of principle or abstract notion outside of God, we are possibly in the position of saying that God conforms to beauty. But if that's the case, if there's some idea, be it harmony, symmetry, or something else, we would then say, why that? And where did that come from? And how would that idea or concept somehow be more ultimate than God? In other words, if you, as Christians do, if you believe that God is the source and ground of all reality, then beauty must be based in God. There cannot be some principle higher than God to which he submits. Apprehending God's beauty, we cannot be satisfied with a definition of beauty abstracted from God. It must be defined in relation to God. And for such a definition, as we've noted, Special revelation, scripture, must show the beauty in general revelation, not the other way around. Beauty in creation, in mankind, in culture, is always secondary and derivative. We cannot judge beauty perfectly from general revelation. So beginning with a theological definition of beauty, it helps us to evaluate the other three groups of definitions. For example, if we take the classical theory, we can say that God's beauty must almost certainly contain the qualities of harmony or symmetry, but it won't do to say that God's beauty is equivalent to those qualities, because if we did that, harmony would become the ultimate good, perhaps unwittingly displacing other attributes of God or claiming in some unwarranted fashion to be the supreme good. And along those lines, we would have to say that the great theory or the classical theory by itself is not sufficient as a theory of beauty. When it comes to the second theory, the transcendental theory of truth and goodness, the same principle applies. We could say that if we apprehend God's beauty, we are apprehending the truth of God's being and the goodness of God's being. But to say that is just to push the question one level back. We will still be forced to ask, what is the nature of that goodness? What is the experience of apprehending the truth of God's being? We've just pushed the question back. We haven't really answered it. And so the transcendental theory cannot stand by itself. And of course, if we adopt a theological definition, it also means that that third theory or the third group of definitions the subjective group also won't do. David Hart in his book, The Beauty of the Infinite, points out the fact that beauty can surprise one shows that beauty is not merely a projection of your own desires. It's an evocation of desire by the object outside the subject. And so it may be true that no beauty exists without beholders, but it's equally true that beholders don't create beauty out of themselves. And all the more when we're talking about God, we are definitely not God. And every apprehension of God is an apprehension of one who's other than us. And so the subjective group of definitions are clearly inadequate. And that pushes us to the theological definitions. God's beauty is what we call an axiomatic first principle. That which is beautiful in God is beautiful because it is in God. It cannot be referred to some standard outside and above God to which God conforms. God is beautiful because God is the object of God's love and because God is the subject of God's love. He is beautiful for those qualities in himself that merit his love and he is beautiful because he loves those qualities. 
Beauty is an absolute first principle. God's beauty is an axiom. And indeed, anyone who talks about beauty is borrowing from the biblical and the Christian worldview. So what then are our options when it comes to defining beauty in relationship to God? We could def- decide with the medieval theologians that beauty is equivalent to God's being. According to the doctrine of simplicity, all that God is, is all that he is. So if God is beautiful, then beauty is not just a part of him. It's simply who and what he is. You see this kind of thinking in the writer Pseudo Dionysius. Beauty is simply what it means to be God. But of course, here we have a problem. If beauty is simply God's being or God's being simply considered, and God's being is the ground of all being, how do we then explain ugliness in the order of things? Certainly, if beauty is to be predicated of God's being, the idea must refer solely to God's being in himself, transcendent, above anything we know. Because unquestionably, in secondary reality, where we live, the created order, God's beauty is not perfectly reflected. Indeed, it is often parodied and warped and distorted. Well, another option, another theological definition would be to see beauty as the manifestation of God's being. For example, Karl Barth saw the beauty of God as the more precise designation of the glory of God. In his words, the sum total of the divine perfection in irresistible self-manifestation. Is this God's beauty, the name for when God's glory is displayed and experienced? A tentative answer may agree that this is a generally safe assumption because scripture does link God's beauty with his glory in several places. But to say that God's beauty is God's glory is merely to substitute a biblical word for a philosophical one and merely drives us to define both more explicitly. We do have a third option. Some medieval theologians combine the classical idea of symmetry with the Trinity, seeing beauty in the three persons of the Trinity as equal, that is, mutually related through the common relation of equality, and their beauty resulting from the proportion of equality parallel to earthly beauty. But in my opinion, they didn't take that far enough. And it was Jonathan Edwards in the 18th century who developed this idea further. Edwards' definition of beauty was simply being's cordial consent to being in general. Perhaps I shouldn't have prefaced that with the word simply, (laughs) because That definition might require a bit of unpacking. What does he mean by consent? Edwards uses that word to mean union or love. What he means is God's benevolence, God's union towards being in general, which is himself, and then towards other benevolent beings. Edwards is defining beauty as God's response to himself, his own ontological being. Yet God's beauty is not merely his being in the static abstract sense. The beauty is how God dynamically responds to God's being. God's dynamic benevolence as inclined and expressed to himself and his works, that is beauty. In other words, not the Trinity as an abstract idea, but Trinitarian love is at the heart of what God's beauty is. Now, notice very quickly what Edwards has managed to do. By using that word consent, he's using the great theory of harmony and symmetry, because to Edwards, consent is the spiritual equivalent of harmony and symmetry. You have symmetry in the created realm, such as in music or color, gravity, but the higher analog is the consent of spiritual love and union. It's a symmetry of wills, of volition. And so the ultimate harmony is God's love of himself, the harmonious symmetry that God has for himself. Edwards has also used the idea of truth and goodness because in his other works, he defines beauty as true virtue, or as we would say, true goodness, 
And finally, Edwards also makes room for the subjective definitions because he defines true virtue, which is subjective love of God's beauty, as having holy affections for God, which in Edwards' writings becomes your spiritual beauty. And so what Edwards has done is that he's actually managed to combine all the theories into one theological theory. What set Edwards apart from his contemporaries and what makes him useful to the contemporary discussion is that he was able to combine subjective and objective aspects of beauty in a theory grounded in God. He was also able to explain beauty as both transcendent in God and imminent in creation. For Edwards, primary beauty is the relationship between persons which he traces back to God himself. And again, as I've said, for Edwards, the real symmetry, the ultimate symmetry, is a symmetry of volitional beings, affection and love. Edwards in one place says that a stone, for example, consents to the law of gravity. It is drawn to the ground in a kind of union with the ground. Edwards looks at that and says this is just a type of love in the spiritual world. Because for Edwards, reality in its most basic form is a relational and dispositional kind of union. At this point, we should probably clarify that for Edwards, God's consent or his loving union is not grounded on more consent because that would just be infinite, infinite regress. In other words, he doesn't love his love. God's love rests not on his love, but on his being itself. God's being simply considered, as Edwards puts it, is what God knows and loves and so communicates. God delights in his own being, in its undivided, infinite essence. Love and delight are the glory that illuminates them, as white light gives color to objects that our eyes see. When God delights in his being and celebrates and radiates pleasure, this is his beauty. God's essence irradiated in delighted self-communication this is God's beauty and God's love. In one sense, God's being simply considered is precisely what you and I can never know. Finite, imminent beings can never know God in that way. Only God can know God in that way. But the result of God's self-knowledge of the truth of his being and the goodness of his being is the love that communicates and shares. This is glory or beauty, the radiance of all God is, but lovingly shared and communicated, first with himself, the Father to the Son, through the Spirit, and then with creation. Now, with this theocentric view of beauty, Edwards explained all other forms of beauty, which he termed secondary beauty. Beauty in the universe is essentially an enlargement, an overflowing of this divine life. It's essentially the beauty of harmony and proportion. And in Edward's mind, it could be manifest in several ways. For example, the believer himself is a special recipient of God's beauty. When we live Christ-like lives, when we have virtue, when we express benevolence, this is beauty, secondary beauty manifesting in us. To love what God loves and to hate what he hates is to become what he is, which is to reflect his beauty. It was even suggested on the societal level, a perfectly harmonious society where you have active and mutually supportive social consent would be an example of secondary beauty. So Edwards thus developed a sound philosophical system that could ground beauty in God while finding a way to explain how such transcendent beauty could be manifest in imminent reality. And in so doing, he was both maintaining the, the classical notions of transcendent beauty while upholding a Christian view of God as the ground of beauty. He was also responding to the philosophes of his time who had doubted beauty's objectivity on the very grounds of its manifest variety. Edward, Edwards turns the argument around. The large varieties of beauty are emanations of God's beauty. 
Secondary beauty is an analogy for primary beauty. And all secondary beauty ultimately points, points back to the great ground of beauty, which is being's consent to be. And so this loving, harmonious sharing of God with himself is the pattern for all forms of creative beauty. The symmetry and harmony of beauty is an analog of God's delighted harmony in himself. The pleasurable variety or surprising diversity in a scene, a musical composition, even a mathematical theory, simply echoes the infinite God beholding himself, communicating this in the sun and the reciprocal delight proceeding in the spirit. The life of the Godhead is ultimate truth, goodness, and beauty. So where does this leave us for Christian worship and Christian living? Perhaps we can conclude by testing this definition with five questions. First, does this definition seem to accord with the Bible's theology of God's glory? I would suggest it does. Throughout scripture, God's glory is his loving exposition of himself as father communicates to son, and then the son, the word, communicates through the spirit to all. All that God is, is known and seen in Trinitarian love. A second question we can ask this definition is this, does it seem to comprehend the multiple definitions of beauty that have been proposed? Does it in any way unify them? As we've seen, it does. Certainly, it prioritizes one version of the theological definition, that is Trinitarian love. But part of its explanatory power is that it's able to include a myriad of other definitions that even non-Christians have postulated in some ways uniting general revelation under special, common grace under particular grace, and fit them into one scheme. A third question we can ask this definition is, does it explain variety in beauty in the created order? And Edwards has done so. It shows us that variety and harmony are created analogs of the ultimate harmony, which is God's love for himself and all that is in union with him. In the fourth place, we can ask, does this definition explain why perceivers may fail to agree on beauty? Now, while this would be a longer and bigger question, it does explain this. It explains particularly that when it comes to primary beauty, the moral condition of the beholder affects your ability to love what God loves. That is, you need to be in union with God to love God's glory. In terms of secondary beauty, the discussion of taste and judgment is related to this question of spiritual maturity, of ordinate affection, which is a separate discussion. And lastly, fifth, does it provide a key for Christian living? I believe it does. The key to the Christian life is the great commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Die to self so as to live to Christ with ultimate love to God, because a believer who does so is in positional and practical union with God and is therefore beholding and participating in the beauty of Trinitarian love. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. DeBrain. A fantastic sort of overview of those definitions and then rooting them in Scripture and particularly the Trinity. Love, love that, uh, that conception. Uh, we have a few minutes here for, uh, for some questions. Uh, those online can feel free to, to jump in or in the room. Um, I've got several in my own head I'd love to ask, but I want to open it up for you all first. Any, any thoughts or questions on this subject? While you're thinking, I'll, I'll just ask you, uh, Dr. DeBrain, you mentioned the, the necessity of our understanding of beauty having sort of real-life practical um, application, and you've, you've touched on that a bit. Can, can you just briefly talk about how does this understanding of Trinitarian beauty 
help us then make judgments of beauty and avoid some of the things you were talking about earlier, the sort of kitschification or sentimentalization of beauty in our modern Christianity and worship? What, how can we use this to help us to make proper judgments in, in what is truly beautiful? Yeah, well, uh, Dr. Aniel, one of the things I would say is that firstly, it pushes us to see that beauty is always personal, that it is, it's not simply a, a set of elements that we're evaluating, but it is grounded firstly in God's own judgment. Uh, God himself loves what is beautiful. We see in Genesis that he keeps making the evaluation, it is good. And so that gives us um, a starting point to say, God loves certain things and does not love others. If so, my pursuit of aesthetic judgment is essentially a pursuit of coming into correspondence with God's loves. I want to love what he loves and hate what he hates. So this immediately removes, I think, the the subjective attitude that uh, there can never be a consensus on any matter of beauty. For that would be like saying, God doesn't view anything as ugly. But if we would agree that God delights in things, firstly in himself and then in secondary reality, we'd have to say that we can, by obedience, by the fear of the Lord, by growth in aesthetic maturity, by development of Christian taste, that we can come closer to loving what God loves. That's good. It, it, it forces us to start with God and our love for him, right? Rather than trying to evaluate properties of a thing uh, are, right. like, like you said, rooted in the great commandment. Yeah, that, that's helpful. We have a, a related question here from one of our PhD students online. He says, I would love to hear more about how this accounts for diversity of perception of secondary beauty. How does this explain taste? So how do we, how do we deal with different perceptions cross cultures, cross individuals regarding what the nature of beauty and what, what is beautiful? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, it, it probably requires a lot more time than, than we have. And I don't want to um, treat it superficially. But I would say that the question of diversities in taste comes down to several factors. Uh, one of them would be uh, what we would simply have to call aesthetic maturity, that there is a development of uh, understanding in this area that is requisite. As much as Hebrews 5.14 tells us that solid food belongs to those who are mature, who by reason of use have their exercises or their senses trained to discern good and evil, the same thing pertains to aesthetics. There is a growth that needs to take place. Um, alongside that, I would say we have to be uh, cognizant of the deformation that can take place in our culture. Uh, that culture is responsible for creating an interpretive grid. We grow up in that grid. And one of the best things we can do is to become aware of how it has already shaped us to lean one way or another, that our tastes have already been formed partly, not irrevocably or permanently, but partly by our culture. And then, of course, there is a certain uh, area that we want to give to personal preference the, within the spectrum of what is true, good, upright, Philippians 4, 8, within that spectrum, there will naturally be a variety of things that believers will prefer over something else that another believer will prefer. And so we should really think of it as when we understand what it is that is Philippians 4, 8, we can expect that there will be variety in our tastes. But that's a very different thing from saying that taste extends right across the board, that there isn't a delimiting of it to where we would say, no, that is ugly, that is impure, that is useless, that is trivial, that is sentimental. Um, that, I think, is the important distinction for Christians to make. Yeah, good, excellent, very, very helpful. Well, we're out of time. Let's thank Dr. DeBrain once again. Very, very helpful. And next week we have the second of our 